questions if you raise your hand or, um, and I'll be doing people's hand raised first. If you don't, you can also put your questions in the chat and on the Slack channel for this breakout session and I'll be looking there too. So, uh, all right. And we have eight, eight minutes per talk with two minutes of questions. So I'll be giving you a two minute warning um, before oh. your talk time is over. All right, and see, you can go ahead and get started. Uh, uh, all right, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings. Uh, so I'm Chinmay Gandevikar. I'm from India. I just graduated uh, from Bitspilani Goa, and I'm a visiting researcher at International Center for Cosmology. I'm here to present my recent work on post newtonian study of extreme mass ratio in spirals using power law. I focus my work on uh, binaries in non-vacuum region. So here is a short overview. Firstly, I would introduce the topic, then I would uh, um, I would uh, introduce my system, the system that I'm considering in this study. Then I'll give a short uh, description of how I did my calculations and then I'll discuss some results. Uh, going, moving forward to results and conclusions and for the scopes, because this topic is uh, pretty new and uh, I think I have something. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so, so I'll just start now. Yeah, so matter distribution around any binary would definitely affect the dynamics of that binary, right? So uh, let's assume that we don't know what kind of matter is there. Let's assume that if there is dark matter, uh, then we are sure it will be uh, it'll, it'll affect in a different way while uh, as compared to that in case of uh, uh, baryonic matter. Now, uh, in this talk, I'll discuss about uh, irrespective of the type of matter that is uh, distributed in the, uh, in the around the binary. I would just discuss how I'm gravitationally uh, looking at this uh, problem or uh, at this scenario. So I've taken my uh, motivation from the book called Gravity by Poison and Will. And my paper has been recently put up on archive and it is titled uh, as so. Yeah. So the extreme mass ratio in spiral is nothing but a super com a supermassive compact object and a stellar mass object uh, rotating around it, uh, revolving around it. And we assume in my study, we assume that uh, the both bodies are point like objects and the distance between the two objects is much, much higher than the sizes of these object, objects. Uh, that ensures that we are way in the uh, regime where BN approximations can be applied. Now, uh, I have taken, I have considered that this mass distribution that was there in the system is very minute and uh, it leads to power law potential. So what is a power law potential? It is general, it is a general form of potential, even Kepler Newtonian potential, which is given over here, the one which we get out of uh, uh, after solving the Schwarzschild's, uh, this thing, uh, Schwarzschild metric, uh, power law potential is just an, uh, just a more general form of it. And we assume that it is obtained by this mass distribution around the uh, supermassive compact object. So here the power is delta. The delta over here is the power that we are uh, uh, talking about. If this delta was to be uh, half, then we have on our hands a Kepler -Newton, uh, Kepler-Newtonian potential. And if we go over this, uh, if the delta goes over half, then we have some non-astrophysical scenario where we have space which is more empty than vacuum. So that is not being considered here. Yeah, so in my study, uh, what I've done is I've taken help of power Newton and approximations so as to have more and more detailed uh, um, expressions of the dynamical quantities as well as the energy radiation from this binary. So these steps are pretty standard. Uh, this, uh, these are picked up from uh, these steps are picked up from the book uh, Gravity itself. First, we put the uh, first we consider the post Newtonian cont uh, contributions on the potential itself, and which are vector which are vector potential, uh, the post Newtonian correction, as well as the super potential. Using these, I derive the acceleration uh, or the equation of motion of the system. And then this leads to obtaining the, uh, the dynamical variables such as the orbital velocity and the orbital frequency. And ultimately, we use the quadruple formalism to get the energy, average energy radiation rate 
from this binary. Uh, one thing that we have considered here is that we are only using completely circular and planar orbits. The res uh, results are as such. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to uh, explain these equations because these are a bit too lengthy. But uh, in the next slide, I've, I've shown the comparison uh, in a graphical fashion. But here uh, in the comparison, I would like to know, I would like to clear that uh, I'm not including the post Newtonian correction part because they are really small and they are negligible at this uh, moment, uh, point of time. Yeah, so as we see the orange curves, uh, okay, I've considered a system which has a supermassive compact object similar to the uh, black hole that we have at the center of the Milky Way, which weighs 10 power six times the mass of sun. Right. Four times I'm, just, 10... I'm gonna interrupt for a two minute warning or maybe uh, a one uh, uh, minute warning, so. Sorry, yeah. sorry. It's just a one minute and then we can take a question maybe and then sure 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 yeah sure. so, you can yeah, so yeah so the uh, supermassive compact object is similar to that we have at the center of the milky way and a stellar mass object we are considering to be uh, as heavy as sun and we observe that the all the uh, orbital velocity or the orbital frequency is much higher than what we would expect from kepler newtonian potential now this this means that having a uh, having dark matter around supermassive compact object, the dynamics of the uh, EMRI changes. And if, if the uh, orbital frequency changes, this means that there will be more energy radiation as well. This means that we will have, uh, the plunge will happen a little faster than expected in the case of Kepler Newtonian potential. So this was the main conclusion of my study. Uh, now I would like to, uh, I would like to note, uh, I would like to bring it to uh, bring it to the attention of uh, the audience that not just gravitational radiation, but also shadow images will provide better information about the dark matter or as well as baryonic matter distribution around these supermassive compact objects. Uh, I think the there was more detailed explanation about shadows and their uh, shape and uh, different aspect of shadows by uh, other speakers like Ashok Choshi or uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Dvanjan there in a, uh, one of the earlier talks. So the further scopes of the study are to make the model more and more astrophysical. Right now, uh, we are only dealing with planar circular orbits. We would like to increase the eccentricity of these orbits. We would like to add non-planar uh, aspects to it. We would uh, like to see how the tidal deformations take place in, uh, in the smaller object. There are n number of possibilities here. And yeah, uh, so this opens up a new uh, uh, scope for multi-messenger astronomy in, uh, involving just EMRIs, which would include uh, radio astronomy as well as uh, gravitational wave observations. Yeah, so I'm sure in five minutes it's, uh, or in six, seven minutes, it's really difficult to conclude my work. So I would be really happy if uh, I have some suggestions or comments or even questions addressed. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. And it's, I think in the interest of time, um, I don't see anyone with hands up right now. And so I'm gonna, and for the interest of time, I'd ask people to put your questions in the chat or on the Slack channel or contact Jinmei directly um, as he's indicated. And we'll move to our next speaker, who's Yifan Chen. Thanks again, Jinmei. Hi, can you see me? Uh, can you see the screen? Or? Yes, we can see you and uh, see the screen, and you should just go ahead and take it away. Okay. Uh, so I would like first to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to talk about uh, some recent and ongoing work with my collaborators. Uh, so we are planning to use the polarimetric measurements of Event Horizon Telescope to look for uh, a particle, so called axions. So here is the message we want to convert. It's like the uh, position angle at each point will be shifted by the presence of axions produced from a so-called super radiance mechanism. So since I think yesterday, uh, there's a talk already uh, explained the basic of axion and the super radiance. So I can speak, uh, skip a lot of details. So in the important message is in the high energy physics community, axion is very important by the so-called strong CP problem uh, also. In the theory with the extra dimension, uh, you can predict a lot of axions with their mass can be very utilized. 
And the thing, uh, important thing we want to focus on here is uh, when there are the occupation number of the axions are very huge, they behave like a coherent wave. The coherent, uh, which means it's a, like a classically oscillating wave with the amplitude proportional to the energy density. And the frequency is the, uh, almost the mass of the axion since they are non-relativistic. So to look for such uh, uh, signals, uh, on the Earth, we are, uh, the row is bounded by the local dark matter density, so which uh, should be small. But uh, however, on the other hand, uh, in the astrophysical observation, we can expect a very huge row. Uh, for example, in the galactic center or some KL black hole, so which we will talk about. So, uh, so there's one mechanism which can generate uh, neutralite axions near the KL black hole, or so-called super radiance, uh, for, I think first by the zero Deutsch. Uh, when the, these axions, the uh, Compton wavelengths is at the same order as uh, of the black hole gravitational radius, their wave function will be exponentially increased, amplified by extracting rotation energy from the black hole. Then they will form a uh, bond state, which is like a gravitational atom, uh, which is similar to a hydrogen atom, and their uh, fine structure constant is uh, proportional, is like the ratio between gravitational radius and the Compton wavelengths. So they will have a discrete energy level and have uh, like similar to the uh, quantum number, uh, like the L and the M is the angular momentum and the azimuthal number. So since they come from the rotation energy, the M is always positive. So we can parameterize the wave function like the, the uh, oscillating part, the azimuthal part, and the, this like a spherical uh, harmonic and the radio part. And for the L equal one, M equal state, it's the like the ground state for uh, the super radi among all the super radiant state. So they are usually the most efficient produced state. So how does this gravitational atom looks like? So uh, they actually they per they are practically uh, they practically like the uh, the accretion disk, the rift type. So the uh, the point the emission point of the ring EHT observed actually is uh, can be quite near the maximum of the radio uh, wave function. So they can be like uh, almost 0 0.9 of the, the maximum of the uh, radio po potential, uh, radio wave functions. Uh, another is uh, once you consider the self-interaction of the axioms, their uh, field value can be as large as the decay constant of the axioms, F, which can be uh, in principle near the gut scale. So uh, the simulation showed that you uh, increase exponentially and the saturated of phase, which equilibrium. Another is uh, for the L equal one, M equal one state, the spherical uh, harmonic func wave function is proportional to sine theta, which means the wave function is peak at the equatorial plane of the black hole, near the black hole. So uh, how do we look for this gravitational atom? So one way is that you go through the so-called bare fringes uh, mechanism is in the presence of axion coupled to the photons, uh, G gamma is a coupling constant, then the Maxwell equation will be modified. So the right-hand part will consider a minus plus, which depending on whether it's left-hand or right-hand photons. So the bare fringe effect is saying the two helicity photons will have different dispersion relations of this term proportional to J gamma, and mu is the unit directional vector of the photons, and it's a total derivative along the line of sight of the photons. So uh, for linear polarized photons, this phase shift will convert to the position angle shift. And this shift is uh, like a topological term, which means it's only dependent on the initial and the final point. For the final point, it's uh, uh, at most the, uh, dependent by the local dark matter density. So for the A, uh, the A at the emission point, it can be huge. So the A is, can be uh, the decay constant from the gravitational atom. Okay, two-minute so, uh, warning. Okay, so, so in, uh, when we take into account the EHT, we should take into account the uh, radiative transfer, which is like we put this action effect into the Faraday rotation. Uh, and the important thing is it's frequency independent. So we put this, uh, this uh, the, the, it's a uh, uh, gradient of along the line of sight. And there's also some washout along the line of sight. And this is the effect that the H, which is a GIF. You can see at each point, it's oscillating. And along the smooth angle, since it's carry angular momentum, it's like a propagation wave. 
So uh, for different mass of the supermassive black hole, you can probe different mass of axions like here. The, the M87 can probe the axion with mass of 10 to minus 20 EV and with a typical period of five days. So the, uh, then the uh, parameter we want to constrain, since axion field value can be near the decay constant, so the, uh, the model dependent parameter is C, which is pro uh, proportional to J gamma times F is related to some, some anomaly number in the UV theory. Okay, so here's the, the, my summary is the, when there's linearly polarized photon from the axion uh, background, then the, you should expect the oscillation uh, of the, this position angle. And how, then we can look uh, to desiccate the axion cloud. Is, uh, it carry, since it carries angular momentum, so it likes uh, propagation of wave along the phi, the azimuthal angle. So what we expect from the NGHT is we can correlate a different frequency of the uh, signal delta EVPA since axion effect is the frequency independent, different from Faraday rotation. Also, we can have the longer and the sequent observations. Uh, we also expect a better resolution of EVPA within a certain time by the larger coverage. Uh, also, we need to understand better the astrophysical background, especially the, the, the uh, thickness of the reef. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. And you ended right on time, so we have two minutes for questions. I see Andre has a, his hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, again, the super radiance effect will be, of course, uh, depending on the actual mass and then can transfer transposing into frequency corresponding to that mass. And yes. uh, wouldn't it be the same for biofringids as well? You also, you also be limited to the uh, masses or the frequencies which correspond to axial mass. So I think for biofringids, the only thing you need to satisfy is the frequency of the photon is much larger than the axial mass. So for the gigahertz uh, frequency, which is definitely satisfied, and uh, yeah, you can go to like uh, even tetahertz or like uh, 10 to minus three gigahertz. Everything is the same for the Bayer fringe effect. Well, the problem is the opposite because your wavelength cor corresponds directly to the, uh, the rotational radius would be tremendously yes. So that's- yes. the, uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, we are, uh, so, so uh, which means the axion, uh, the mass is like the, within a narrow wind, mm -hmm. right? Okay, thanks. Okay, um, we might have time for one more quick question, if someone has one. I don't see any other hands. Uh, so let's thank you, Yvonne, again, and we'll move on to um, our next speaker isn't able to be here in person, uh, it's Vikram Ravi, but we, have, we received a presentation that's recorded from him. So we're gonna just play it. And if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or the Slack and I'll direct them to him. Hold on one sec. I'm sharing my screen with the video. Share. Can everyone see this? Yep, we can see it. Thanks. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm really sorry that I cannot be there with you in person today. Well, even virtually in real time, I suppose. We need to find a word for this. But I hope you enjoyed this talk. So I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about some of the non-horizon science that really excites me about the NGEHT. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Vikram Ravi. I am an assistant professor of astronomy at Caltech. And I'm involved in the project primarily by helping out to implement some NGEHT hardware at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. So I framed this talk around some of the key features that the NGEHD provides relative to current capabilities. And to me, they can be summarized as follows. So first of all, it almost goes without saying that the NGEHD will provide substantially improved snapshot imaging capability. So of course, as you can see here in this figure from the Lindy Blackburn et al. APC white paper submitted to the AFTRA 2020 survey, you can see that the addition of these sites in Cyan, these potential NGEHD sites, adds a heap more baselines that will allow the NGEHD to be able to get high fidelity images on much shorter timescales than is currently possible. Now, the second thing is that in the future, we will have much better anchor stations 
than are available today. So of course, ALMA is available today in the ALMA 2017 array, as can be seen here in this plot of the baseline sensitivity as a function of dish diameter, given different um, anchor stations. ALMA is really great, but ALMA is only available for a fraction of the time. With dedicated facilities and the availability of NOEMA, as well as an upgraded LMT, one would hope that the NGEHT will be able to really perform the sensitive uh, millimeter VLBI observations, not necessarily more sensitive than what can be done with ALMA today, but certainly at a much higher duty cycle than can be done today. So the idea is time of sky, modest sensitivity improvement, massive improvement in snapshot imaging capability. So the first thing I'll be talking about today is the idea of resolving the orbits of binary supermassive black holes. Now, I'm sure that you've already heard about the really exciting science one can do with binary supermassive black holes in this meeting. Um, certainly Sarah Spallauer and Alberto Cezana would have mentioned this in their talks. And the idea here is that by timing an array of millisecond pulsars throughout the Milky Way, one can detect the very slow and weak variations caused by gravitational waves from binary supermassive black holes throughout the universe. Of course, one does not do this timing at millimeter wavelengths. One will do it, and people are doing it at the moment, with centimeter wavelength telescopes. And in the 2030s, this effort will be led by the SKA, the DSA 2000, and the NGBLA. And the idea is that at this time, pulsar timing arrays will actually be identifying and roughly localizing individual sources of gravitational waves, so individual supermassive black hole binaries with which one can do multi-messenger astrophysics. And so what I try to consider is the ranges of parameter space within which the NGEHT can actually resolve the motion, the orbital motion of at least the primary supermassive black hole. And so what I did here is first of all, in this redshift versus primary supermassive black hole mass parameter space, I considered the range where the pulsar timing rays of the 2030s will be sensitive. It is to the right of this plot, so this region here. And then I considered what might be done with different VLBI configurations. Now, a 15,000 kilometer configuration of the ground is somewhat, is just somewhat extreme. <laughs> um, and you sort of see here that even with that, it's kind of difficult to resolve the, all these orbits. However, when you actually go to space, either with a 200,000 kilometer baseline or even with just an orbiter, one is actually able to resolve this motion. You might ask, what does space have to do with the NGEHT? Well, what I would say is that I don't think we need to stay incredibly sort of tied to the ground with the NGEHT. It's certainly conceivable, and not just for the science, but for several other very interesting high resolution science cases, that a component of the NGEHT would actually be a spacecraft, um, which I hope is not too controversial a suggestion, but I certainly think it's an interesting one. In any case, with a space-based configuration, multi-messenger astrophysics should be possible with the NGEHT and the pulsar timing rays of the 2030s. Now, of course, there are several assumptions that go into a plot like this, but nonetheless, this at least highlights the possibility of this going forward. The next thing I want to talk about is the idea of directly measuring the sizes of bright extragalactic explosions. So what we're talking about here are exotic supernovae and gamma ray bursts, as well as the tidal disruption events of stars by supermassive black holes. Now, we know that these events generate luminous millimeter wave emission, or at least we've been finding a few tantalizing sources in the last few years. And what's particularly exciting to me is that the NGEHT will be sensitive to relativistic expansion on just few weak timescales, all the way out to 100 megaparsec. By sensitive, I mean we'll actually be able to resolve the expansion of the source. Of course, you know, to catch these things, which make, which within this distance, um, for things that are particularly bright, like 100 Milojansky or so, these things go off roughly once a year, and you really do want to catch them within weeks. And so for this, 
the, the rapid scheduling that is a potential application of the NGEHT will be critical. What we see here in a plot from Anna Ho is sort of the light curves of the very few millimeter bright transients that we know about today in comparison with those observed at centimeter wavelengths. And the potential here is really to catch them early and in their most exciting phases. By catching them early, one probes the silicon um, explosion medium directly adjacent to the explosion sites, as well as by actually resolving the expansion, one can break degeneracies in modeling total energy of the um, explosion, as well as the geometry of the explosion. Finally, I want to quickly mention the idea of probing the nature of dark matter with radio millilensing. So of course it goes without saying to this audience that dark matter is a mystery. I would argue that the candidate dark matter particle spans 91 orders of magnitude all the way from the sort of fuzzy dark matter to um, tens of uh, uh, solar mass black holes and with a whole zoo of candidates in between. But one particularly interesting way of discriminating between these candidates is by figuring out what the halo mass function looks like at the low mass end. And so radio lensing surveys have played a leading role in the past in identifying uh, strong lenses, and more recently um, with ALMA, to actually try to pull out evidence of these of substructure within larger dark matter halos to try and constrain the existence of these smaller halos within the universe. And what I'm particularly excited about is the idea of radio micro and milli lensing. Now, milli lensing is a very sort of relatively nebulous phenomenon so far, but some really interesting evidence was uncovered by a group led by Tony Reedhead and Harish Vedal from Caltech, where what we found is that we actually saw in the light curve of this BLAC source J1415 to 1320, these really interesting sort of symmetric variation features that repeated. And what we noticed as well is that these were actually achromatic and we infer in this system the presence of milli lensing by, a, by a something between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 6 solar mass. The idea is that you actually have components in the jet of the sphere lac passing behind the lens. What we would absolutely love to do is make an image of this system, which is, as you can see, incredibly bright. It's actually well over a Jansky at 230 gigahertz. What would be particularly interesting would be to actually measure potentially image splitting during the lensing events. And we predict that these will be observable on roughly 100 micro arc second scales. Certainly within the reach of the NGEHT, but sensitivity as well as scheduling would be particularly important. And so let me leave you here with my conclusions. I think that space VLBI is an interesting potential component of the NGEHT. But in general, the rapid scheduling, as well as sensitivity, as well as the image fidelity, which is particularly important to the millilensing case, will be a really critical in addressing these interesting science cases. Thanks. I should also mention, please feel free to reach out with questions by email. Um, I'm more than happy to also schedule times to chat. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, uh, Nick, for playing the video. Uh, Juan, are you there? Yes, I am here. I'm, I'm sorry. Hi. No, no worries. I'm there was a confusion with timing. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we'll just hand it. Are you able to share your screen? Yes, yes just a minute. OK. Can you see it? Yes, we see the whole application window right so, now. That's right. So I'm going into showing mode. Is that okay? Great, perfect. Yes, take it away. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so it's a pleasure to give uh, this talk to you. I'm not a, a member of a, the Event Horizon Telescope. I'm a, a scientist, a, a, a 
physicist, particle physicist, actually, who's uh, interested or into how, what are the different ways in which we can probe a uh, fundamental physics uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, my uh, interest is mostly on to primordial black holes. And this is what I'm going to describe to you in this, uh, in this presentation. What is the multi-messenger science that we can probe with the Event Horizon Telescope and the next generation Event Horizon Telescope and whether we can say anything about primordial black holes. So I'll give you a very brief summary since uh, we only have uh, about 10 minutes for the presentation. Primordial black holes have become a really hot topic since the detection by LIGO Virgo of a binary black hole mergers of a spinless and on spinless, massive black holes in the range of one to 100 solar masses. We don't know really their origin. They could have a fraction of them be uh, astrophysical. However, it is also possible that uh, these black holes are actually primordial and they arise from the radiation era where fluctuations produced during inflation would generate these upon re-entry in the radiation era. If this is true, then uh, we just help have opened a, a new window into the exploration of the early universe. And this might be the case also with the Event Horizon Telescope, because there are features of these primordial black holes which are unique to them. And uh, we might be able to access them with uh, new techniques like uh, those that you explore in the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, their existence and contribution to dark matter uh, could be a, a fractional. So they could be a, a fraction of the dark matter, or they could be 100% of them. And that depends very much on what is their nature, what, how are they distributed in mass, and how they're distributed in, uh, in space, so how, whether they're clustered or not. Fortunately, in the next few years, the mass and spin distributions of uh, these black holes uh, may be known by the LIGO, Virgo, and Kagera uh, detectors, or antennas, and also by microlensing surveys. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you might also be able to uh, test the, the clustering properties, especially clustering properties from next generation of multiple structure catalogs. Okay. So uh, let me briefly describe what they are. There are uh, fluctuations. We know that see the structure initiated from quantum fluctuation during inflation. Those are stretched by the tremendous expansion during inflation and uh, seed the CMB uh, fluctuations in temperature and polarization. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the scales at which those fluctuations left the horizon during inflation and the scales that when they re-enter into radiation and matter. Most of the fluctuation we observe on the CMB arise from say 50 to 60 e folds before the end of inflation and they have a very small amplitude. Those are the one part in 10 uh, to the five fluctuations that uh, we believe seed um, the CMB fluctuations, the temperature and, and polarization. Now fluctuation on smaller scales, so much of structure, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, left about 50 to 40 EFOS after, before the end of inflation. But there are some scales which we do, do not directly probe with logical structure or the, or the CMB, which could have left, say, uh, between 40 and 20 EFOS before the end of inflation. And those correspond to scales that enter the horizon in the electric epoch, between the electric epoch and the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Those are the ones that could have a much larger amplitude and therefore uh, generate primordial black holes. Now, this might look very exotic, but fortunately there are uh, scenarios uh, that we develop, which are based on uh, the standard model Higgs, uh, the, the standard model particle physics uh, scalar that we have uh, recently discovered at the LHC, the Higgs, which could have a non-minimal coupling to gravity and generate a potential in the early universe that could give rise to such features. And this arises because there is, apart from a flat plateau and on very large scales, which would give rise to the CMB anisotropies, there is a little a deep in the potential, some feature in the potential, which makes the scale field go slightly slower and allow for a larger amplitude of fluctuations, which would then collapse to form black holes. So this is the kind of spectrum that we have in mind and we de uh, derived in, in this scenario. So the very large structure, uh, large scale structures uh, are uh, in agreement with what we observe in the CMB, yeah? but on smaller scales, wave numbers of order 10 to the eight to 10 to the 14, they could be much larger in amplitude. When those fluctuations re-enter the horizon in the radiation era, in the, when there is still a primordial plasma, those fluctuations would generate gradients across the horizon 
And these gradients would create forces which are stronger than radiation restoring forces. Therefore, nothing would prevent the collapse. This is what uh, Penrose realized and was recognized with the Nobel Prize a few months ago. So these kind of features, which if they collapse to form uh, primordial black holes, they would have a very interesting uh, uh, distribution because it would its mass would be related to the amount of mass which is within the horizon at the time of a collapse. And also they are such their, their collapse is so fast and all of the mass within the horizon collapse to form the black hole, there's essentially no contraction hmm, compared to that of a supernova remnant, that uh, they don't have any spin. Hmm. Now, of so course, one, one minute this warning. has been, excuse me? One minute warning. One minute, only yeah. one minute. Wow, okay, then, then I'll have to go fast. So uh, the, the, uh, most of the constraints uh, assumed that uh, primordial holes were uniformly distributed and monochromatic, just a single mass, but that's not the uh, scenario which uh, now is uh, most robust and, and uh, satisfies all the constraints, but actually that of a, a clustered uh, primordial black holes and in a broad mass distribution. Now, uh, let me go faster. It, once uh, you have the distribution of uh, fluctuations, as they re-enter, it depends very much on the radiation pressure that opposes collapse. And this depends on the evolution of the uh, relativistic degrees of freedom of the universe. So there's a prediction for having masses out around the proton uh, decoupling, so they, when they annihilate, and also when the pions uh, also annihilate among them. So we're talking about masses of order two to 100 solar masses. Now this, primordial black holes could have been seen up already uh, by the LIGO uh, vertical collaboration. There are certain astrophysical mass gaps which uh, cannot be accounted for by usual stellar evolution, which have been observed yeah? and where uh, you, you could have primordial black holes uh, explaining the, the observations. Not just uh, gravitational waves, also from uh, microlensing events. Uh, these events uh, are seen through uh, magnification of stars. And these also uh, probe a region where you don't, do not expect to have a uh, black holes, which is below 1.4 solar masses, below the Chandrasekhar mass. Now there's a whole distribution of masses within the range probed by uh, LIGO Virgo. They are in agreement with the observations in the sense that we know the rate of, ex of events that we should expect. And indeed they agree with the observations both in GWTC1 and GWTC2. As I said, they are a uh, spinless. This is what a uh, Ligon like Virgo seem to uh, observe. And in the future, with this I will end, in the future we will have much better um, interferometers like the Einstein telescope or, or the Cosmic Explorer with much larger, let's say 10 kilometer arms to be able to be sensitive to uh, not just the epoch of uh, formation of stars and later on possibly a uh, black holes through stellar evolution, but the really primordial dark eras where there are no stars. And therefore, if we observe um, the merger of black holes at redshift between 20 and 100, we are really probing a primordial black hole. Uh, structures. Now, in the future, LISA and uh, the uh, other interferometers will be able to, to probe very high redshifts and therefore determine whether they are primordial. So with this, I conclude. Diffusion, quantum diffusion during inflation inevitably generates primordial black holes. The thermal history would determine a multimodal mass distribution with different scales. And here's where uh, the observation of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses uh, with the event horizon telescope might open the window to the exploration of those scales. The predicted spin and mass distribution will be measured by LIGO and Virgo and possibly in the future also by the event horizon telescope and next generation and uh, also by microlensing. This uh, scenario can be explained many different conundra which at the moment are uh, problematic in the art scenario of cosmology and it will definitely change the small scale the distribution of logical structure for structure formation in the universe. So with this, I, I finish, and I'm sorry if I went over time. Okay. Thanks for Thank your you. attention. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, uh, Andre, I see your hand is raised. Can you ask a question really quickly? Question. Presumably a number of these primordial black holes should be the humongous, and therefore mergers of those should be also very numerous. Wouldn't that be detectable because, would it be causing confusion for the gravitational wave detectors? 
Well, indeed, we expect them in LISA, I'm a member of LISA, and we do expect mergers of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses. So those would be uh, orbiting, if they form the halos of galaxies, they would be orbiting around the central black hole. They would, by the dynamic of friction, will go to the center. And we should see how those uh, extreme mass ratio spirals um, are, are probing uh, the nature of those black holes. So we should see whether they, uh, they are spinning and whether, uh, of course, the central black hole would probably would have an increase in mass due to accretion of gas, but those that are uh, moving around this black hole would probably be a primordial. So indeed, that would induce a, a, a confusion, except that uh, there will be a distribution of masses that you would not expect to be as numerous as those uh, coming from a stellar evolution. And therefore, if we see an, an extra abundance of black holes with respect to you, what you would expect, well, it, it is natural to expect they are uh, primordial in origin. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say everyone should direct their other questions for Juan to the uh, chat or to the Slack channel. And our next speaker is gonna be Wei Xian Xiao. I hope uh, I didn't uh, hi. your name too much. Thank you. Uh -oh. Hi, can you hear Stop me? sharing. Yes, we can hear you. So let me share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Uh, and so I'll just start. Yes. Yeah. So um, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful meeting. I'm Wei Xiang Xiao from Taiwan, and I'm going to discuss one of the solution generating methods developed in recent years for a certain class of gravitational theories. And this talk will be mostly overlapped with this work with Zhe Yu Chen, who also gave a talk at this meeting on black hole shadows. So in the wake of the imaging by EHT and the detection of gravitational waves, analysis of black hole data have confirmed that general relativity is the correct low energy description of gravity. That being said, there are still open issues remaining, particularly in cosmology. And from a theoretical point of viewpoint, it is also reasonable to expect that GR is not the final story. Thus, it would be nice to study gravitational theories that extend beyond GR either in an effective field theory sense or simply as modified theories of gravity. And with black holes being the key targets of future observations, we are in a promising era in which these modifications, along with their space-time solutions, can be put to test as observations probe deeper into the strong gravity regime. Now, there will still be difficulties in surveying their predictions to the full extent if we do not have precise knowledge of the gravitational field produced in these theories. So efficient methods designed to obtain exact analytic solutions would be highly desirable. And ideas have been put forward to pursue exact solutions in a systematic way for a particular class of gravitational theories called Ricci-based gravity theories. They are metric affine theories whose gravitational Lagrangian is constructed out of contra contra contractions between the metric and the symmetrized Ricci tensor. Now I won't go into the details, but such construction basically ensures consistency with the speed of gravitational waves and the absence of pathologies, yet at the same time still encompassing a garden variety of modified gravity theories in the literature. And moreover, such construction allows us to perform a transformation on the metric G and arrive at the Einstein frame representation in which the matter sector contains new interactions and is now coupled to the Einstein frame metric Q. So rather than tackling the field equations directly, we can exploit this mapping to find classical solutions on one side simply by borrowing from the bag of solutions on the other side and vice versa. So now I'm just going to illustrate the implementation of this idea by an example. Let's begin with a scalar deformed curve solution, which has a naked null singularity at what would be the event horizon in GR minimally coupled to a free scalar. So there is an additional scalar parameter sigma besides the mass and spin. Suppose we want to see if we could smooth out the naked singularity by studying the extension of the solution in a setting where there are higher derivative modifications in both the gravity and matter sector at some born infield scale epsilon. An exact solution can, can indeed be generated by the mapping, but it turns out that the high energy corrections are only able to suppress but not remove the curvature divergence of the singularity. And equipped with the solution, 
The stage is now set for us to proceed to draw connections with observations by analyzing the shadow cast by this compact scalar object. Here we have the familiar setup often used in studies related to shadows and lensing. Due to the azimuthal symmetry of the previously obtained solution, this setup can be done, and the observer sees the shadow as being projected onto the plane spanned by the celestial coordinates alpha and beta. And the relation and or the transformation between alpha, beta, and the spherical coordinates at the observer's location can be obtained where these terms depend on the geometry of the spacetime. More precisely, since we're focusing on shadows, they are determined by the photon region, which consists of unstable spherical null orbits. But without the killing tensor associated to a Carter-like constant for this spacetime, the geodesic equations are in general not decoupled. However, we can work with decoupled equations and therefore simplify our discussion by only considering photon trajectories close to the equatorial plane. So this in turn implies that we're working in the case where the inclination angle theta zero is close to pi over two. As we will see, this naive first order analytic result allows us to immediately get a sneak peek of some key features without yet resorting to a full-blown numerical ray tracing analysis. So here are yeah, the apparent shapes. Warning. Yeah? Two minute warning. Oh, sorry, thank you. So here are the apparent shapes as seen by a distant observer on the equatorial plane. The dashed black curve illustrates the shadow contour of a curved black hole, whereas the red, blue, and green curves correspond to cases where sigma takes values above each panel. So echoing some of the talks on Tuesday, here we have another example where, despite the underlying entity being a naked singularity, it is still capable of casting shadow thanks to the existence of a photon region which acts as a potential barrier for impacting photons. And um, these shadows are in fact completely identical for the two space times related via the mapping, independent of high energy born infill corrections. Such a degeneracy can be accounted for by the fact that the mapping relation will leave the photon region unchanged as long as the null geodesic equations are separable and the matter fields are spherically symmetric. In this example, we have forced separability by restricting ourselves to constant theta. So the degeneracy is only accidental and will not be true in the full picture. And as is often the case for space times with a naked singularity, there exists a region in parameter space where the resulting contour reduces to an open arc. In this example, it is the prograde photon region orbits close to the equatorial plane that cease to exist as the scalar charge exceeds a spin-dependent critical value. This causes the shadow contour to be chipped away from the left, and consistency with, uh, con consistency with observations then constrains the scalar charge to be small, which further implies that the full exact shadow, even when observed from different inclination angles, will only deviate a little from that of a curved black hole. And lastly, from, from this naive approximation, we can get a rough idea of how the shadow is influenced by the scalar. The orientation of the scalar-induced deformation is not horizontal, as, it, as in the usual cases involving parameters such as electric charge or tidal charge. But again, this is merely a special case for an equatorial plane observer. Still, it will be interesting to see how this will turn out in the precise description of the entire shadow. So um, the goal is to efficiently enrich the pool of exact solutions which describe possible astrophysical compact objects. And as the side note, uh, there are actually quite a few ways to obtain solutions in different classes of modified gravity theories. But I would like to share with the audience a different viewpoint by mentioning one of the alternative routes, which I think is more general and has a much larger applicability. Um, this is utilizing modern amplitude techniques for possibly extending the Newman Genes algorithm, deriving spacetime metrics, and also extracting observables such as scattering angles and impulses um, in, in these kind of computations. It has shown to be extremely useful, number one, due to manifesting gauge invariance by working on shell, which bypasses the complications of solving field equations, and number two, mainly because this technology has seen considerable developments over the last decade to greatly simplify computations. 
So here are just some reference, just to list a few that are relevant for deriving space-time metrics. So that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna to have to go straight to our next talk. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat or the Slack channel or save them for the uh, discussion section coming up. Uh, so without further, is Ma Machek, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, um, uh, I need to ask the speaker to uh, stop sharing. Oh, yes. <laughs> because I cannot share, um, oh, I can share, okay, good. Great. Uh, right. Okay, so last but not least, we have Maciek and I'll just let you get going. So that Yay, last talk, uh, finally. <laughs> uh, hello everyone. So uh, this will be a very short uh, talk. I will repeat a couple of things that you might have heard already do, uh, during this meeting. And by the end, there will be like a slide of two with uh, some new stuff. And by new, I mean, I literally uh, made those plots an hour ago. Uh, so uh, I hope it will be useful, interesting for you. Okay. Uh, so even though I have so little time, I will nevertheless start with taking like one minute to show you this eye candy EHT propaganda in a very good sense propaganda. I'm not saying this pejoratively uh, to explain uh, this idea of uh, uh, rings uh, forming the uh, final image. So you've seen photons that are not bent too much uh, around the black hole. They are forming this uh, diffused um, uh, large uh, uh, ring. And then you see photons that uh, are uh, more strongly lensed. You see the ring becomes sharper, meaning those guys are uh, start to forget where they were emitted and only th this location in the uh, plane of the observer uh, do not depend much on, uh, on the fact where they were emitted. And then by the time you get to the second ring, um, second photon ring, uh, photons really don't remember where they were emitted. They are indifferent to the astrophysics, to the location of the emission. They only care about the geometry uh, of, uh, of space time. So this is the how we believe the, uh, this thing that we are imaging really looks like, but of course we have a finite resolution. So we are mostly sensitive to this direct emission, uh, which is a little bit of a problem for us because, uh, this is a figure from one of the EHT papers. And you can see those two uh, components here. You can see this diffused uh, emission and you can see this focused more lensed uh, emission from, uh, from the first photon ring. And you can see that while this N equal one, this uh, photon ring is pretty much very similar size in, uh, it's kind of indifferent to the spin, to the plasma parameters that went into GRMHD model. Uh, this diffused emission, this direct emission uh, can vary in size. So even if you fix the parameters of space-time, just plasma parameters, some astrophysical effects uh, will cause it to, to, to look different depending on, on the parameters of your uh, simulation. So let's uh, give it a name. Let's call this guy dirty astrophysics. And let's call this guy uh, less dirty astrophysics. Uh, why not uh, clean uh, gravity? We will see in a couple of slides. Uh, so this causes a lot of problem to the Event Horizon Telescope because while observing the ring of diameter of say 42 micro arc seconds, uh, does, is not model dependent. There is a ring of 42 micro arc seconds in the sky where the core of M87 uh, is. Uh, translating it to mass is becoming difficult because of those uncertainties related to dirty astrophysics. And we did this careful calibration, uh, uh, but you may see these are, uh, these are the posterior distributions of mass over distance um, if, uh, obtained through fitting uh, simulations to the data. You can see that there is quite a bit of variety of M over D that we can get that would translate to these really large uncertainties. We only give uh, one sigma uncertainties, but if we really wanted to include full width of these posteriors, you see we would have like 300% uh, of uncertainties in our mass estimation. That uh, is kind of a, a problem. Uh, 
So apart from that, because all of all those astrophysical uncertainties, uh, we had this idea with uh, a colleague, uh, Frederick uh, Van Song, that we would try to just take the same models uh, of astrophysics, ray trace them in uh, different space times, possibly weird space times, and see if uh, EHT 2017 could uh, see the difference. And the answer is that it cannot really see the difference in 2017 configuration, whether it is a boson star, a wormhole, or a Kerr black hole. But you can already see in this image that there is this nice n equal one sharp ring here. There is nothing here. This boson star has, uh, to, uh, is not compact enough to have a photon ring. And here there is like a hot mess of many different uh, sharp features because there is more than one uh, photon sphere uh, in this uh, wormhole construction. So a hint is, well, if we were able to uh, get to measuring those guys, then our problems with dirty astrophysics would be at least mitigated to, to a degree. And uh, <clears throat> I must admit that when we were publishing these results like two years ago, uh, this e uh, image of, of a black hole, uh, I really didn't, uh, I only later I understood that I didn't really understand what is in the image. And it took us uh, more than a year, uh, to me at least, maybe other people were better at that, uh, to really understand uh, the morphology of this image. And one of the tools given to us uh, to understand that are both transfer functions of Grala uh, and, uh, and Alex Lupsaska. So the way they work, you translate the radius of emission uh, into location in the observer screen, and this is this dirty astrophysics part. This is this direct emission. And it actually behaves in a very simple way. You take a uh, radius of emission, you add one, and you get the location um, uh, in the observer screen corresponding to the radius of the ring that you are seeing. But you also see that wherever you put your emission, that's what radius you will get in the observer screen. So it's really sensitive to the location of the emission. Then there are these guys this less dirty astrophysics part, they are pretty much indifferent to the uh, radius of emission, right? Whatever is the radius of emission, you will get a, a location of the ring in the observer screen somewhere around here. So that sounds good. And then there is this critical curve uh, about which most of the research in the field uh, is uh, concentrated on, which is great. It's only depending on gravity, but it's also non-existent in a sense that it's not an observable. There is no flux corresponding exactly to the location of the uh, critical curve. So really, uh, there is a, this tacit assumption here that, uh, well, that we are really going to probe high order photon rings, which are sufficiently close to the critical curve that we can ignore or these small discrepancies. Uh, and this, this is just an illustration how, what situation in this GRMHD library of models would correspond to particular locations on this curve. So here you see a guy where this direct emission is smaller than the uh, focused emission of the photon ring. Here you see that they are approximately uh, same uh, diameter. And here you see the, uh, the case uh, where it's the uh, uh, this emission uh, direct emission ex extended with respect uh, respect to the photon ring uh, emission, so it looks like we could do something useful about it, and maybe we could go uh, and maybe try um, uh, working on it in some different space types. So, hey, Machek, sorry, you're technically out of time, so just oh, wrap it up in one minute. I thought then, you would give me oh, two minutes warning. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries at I've, all. Okay. You started late, so quick. I'm going to give you two minutes to go. Yeah. It's going to be very, very quick now because we are at this uh, short part where there are new, there is new stuff that I'm showing. So just uh, if you zoom uh, to, uh, to the, uh, this is this transfer curve, we just zoomed into it. This, this is the Schwarzschild one, and this is Reisner Nordstrom with a critical um, uh, charge parameter. This is the measurement uh, that EHT made for, for the ring, uh, uh, attempting to translate it to the, to the proper units here. So how do we interpret it? We interpret it that it's mostly direct emission. Direct emission is this magenta line. So what it's telling us is really just that the emission radius is about 4m. 
But what would happen if that was the EHT measurement? What would we do then? Well, we would just say that, well, it's clearly consistent with Schwarzschild, but uh, the emission radius is uh, about three, not about four. So, you know, this difference between uh, three and four is, is little difference. You don't really have control over, over astrophysics um, uh, to, uh, to, to do this uh, re reliably. But if, uh, we, if that was a measurement of the uh, photon ring, uh, clearly we would exclude Schwarzschild because a uh, first photon ring for Schwarzschild could never give you this uh, value of the, the of the diameter. You could actually exclude all of Kerr solutions if that was the, the measurement. So clearly there is a nice way to probe um, uh, exotic space times uh, with uh, photon rings. And I will, this is my uh, almost last slide. This is structure of two examples of weird exotic space time, Reisner Nordstrom and Ka Kazakov Soloduki. Uh, we, these are the lapse functions, so just GTT minus GTT looks like that in both space times. And we, this is where you can have this uh, shadow of a first photon ring, the blue shaded area, and between magenta line is the second photon ring, where can it be? And if you just consider this as a function of a charge, this is Schwarzschild, the gray stuff. So clearly, if you uh, made a measurement of the first photon ring here, you would clearly know that this cannot be Schwarzschild, and so on you can exclude different variants of space times, different solutions based on those measurements on the first photon ring. And this uh, darker band is the second ring. So the second one is really telling you a lot. And this is my last slide with some comments. I will not read them aloud. Uh, this is just a point for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are um, technically over the time into the coffee break. Uh, so, um, and I Everyone is free to, you know, go take a coffee break now and the next discussion section will start at uh, 3.30 Eastern time, which I need to know that, which is uh, 8.30 UT. Uh, so, um, Andre, I see your hand is raised and can, I guess we can just continue the discussion I'm, here. I, I'm here. <laughs> Waste yeah. the coffee break, yeah, okay. Um, yes, but very, I don't have coffee. <laughs> very nice analysis, I like it. But, um, aren't you going to be killed by dirty astrophysics on the level of determining the mass of the central black hole? To That's a wonderful mass? question. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, uh, the important uh, part is uh, what kind of priors of, on ma mass over distance you can place. So, yeah, I, I, I actually think, like, ima imagine that we get something really different than the expectation. What would you say? First thing you would say is, well, probably we got the mass right. Uh, no, wrong, for sure, yeah, but I totally if, agree. If you get a chance to get a good image of such a star, that would be the place, right? So, because the gravity will give you mm -hmm. already gives you a, a very, very tight errors on the mass. Yeah, well, you can also hope for future better M over D constraints that do not rely on strong uh, gravity regime. I think I asked uh, no, I mean, <laughs> about yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, I meant your optical measurements, the gravity measurements, give you very nice constraints in such a style. We need some, something like that in M87, then we, then we gain. Maybe JWST. Ah, we don't have to go that far. So, so I mean, Maciek, you'll, you'll have seen this, but we, we've been thinking about what happens if you could observe more than one of these rings, right? If you can observe, um, if you can observe uh, anything above the n equals zero, you can observe everything below it too, right? So you, if, you, if you could get up to the n equals two ring, you also have the n equals one and the n equals zero. And then you can start playing a game with their relationships. Uh, and if you get very fortunate, you, you also can, can do this at different times when the emission, that dirty astrophysics is different. And both of those things, um, you know, have strong, strong expectations from GR. Uh, and you can't really fix them all up by just varying the mass and the spin universally. So, so I think that there, there are interesting games that you can, you can play as soon as you start combining observations of rings and combining observations of rings across multiple epochs. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. Like different combination that would uh, uh, cancel out the dependence on mass, that, that, that is definitely something that could be uh, interesting. It's going to take a lot of strain on the uh, NGHT observations, right? So you get, if you want to get all that ring structure resolved and, and characterized 
those probably equally not easy as just to get the mass of the black hole to the same accuracy. I, I cannot imagine getting n equal to without really hundreds of giga lambda uh, uh, spatial frequency. So th that means it's not an uh, earthbound observation. Yeah, n equals two has got to be very difficult, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility to get n, n equals one. And so imagine we could get the n equals one and the n equals zero in a source that's necessarily variable. So we could see it a few different times and, 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 and presumably the emissions coming then from different positions. Yeah. This is, this is, this is just another flavor of using variability to, to help sort out some of the, some of the degeneracies. But um, you know, the, way, the way I think about this is that you, you measure the astrophysics with the n equals zero Im image. And, and now that you've measured that, you insert that to get your implications for the n equals one image. I guess we have to move out. In we have 45 seconds to continue. <laughs> so see you in, the, in another dimension. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, 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 very, I totally agree with what you said. Um, there are, on the other hand, a lot of systematics there that it's difficult to, uh, well, clearly they are not yet constrained. That is a job for <laughs> near future be, be, before it's properly that, that's right. put that's to okay. a proper use. The real question is how much SNR do we need? Yeah. All of it. All of it. <laughs> we are going to be kicked out of the breakout room, so I'm going to yeah, no. ask you to continue. <laughs> we're, pre 